fund the places that are optimistic, diverse, dynamic, moving forward, and his whole campaign, Make America Great Again, was looking backwards. I think it was wrong how she put it. I, I think it certainly is being taken out of context, which, you know, but she knows things that you say are taken out of context. So for those of us that are in states that Trump won, uh, we would really appreciate if she would be more careful and show respect to every American voter and not just the ones who voted for her. That was Democratic Senator Claire McCaskill on KCDC responding on Sunday to Hillary Clinton's comments about Trump voters from earlier this month. Let's bring in now former White House Director of Communications under President Obama and Communications Director for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, Jen Palmieri. Her new book is titled Dear Madam President, an open letter to the women who will run the world. Hey, Jen, thanks so much for being with us. We want to talk about the book. Uh, but first, let's talk about the dust up that <laughs> Hillary Clinton uh, had, I guess, just last week or so when she um, when she spoke in India. Do you agree with Claire McCaskill that she may need to be a bit more careful with the words she chooses? Yeah, I think I agree with Carol McCaskill that you need to respect voter, that you should respect all voters, voters who vote for you and voters who don't. And also that, and something that I write about in the book is that candidates need to talk to all voters, whether they're going to vote for you or not, particularly presidential candidates. You know, you are, at a minimum, you want to be the president of the entire country, and you need to speak to everyone, and you need to have everybody understand that whether they're going to vote for you or not, you see that they have a place in America, and I think that that is something that's been that's been lacking in politics. It's something that I own in the book as, as, as a mistake as a political professional that you think about just talking to the voters who are going to vote to you. And I think that's partly right. to blame for why we have such divisions. You know, Jen, I remember talking to you. It must have been maybe two days before Election Day. And I asked, how's everything looking? And I remember you telling me, and I was surprised at the time you told me this. You said, you know what? If the if the election went another week, uh, things would be pretty rough in Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, but we think we're going to hold on, but it's going to be close. So you actually were a lot of us were shocked on election night. You weren't you all saw things breaking for Trump in the last few days of the campaign. Tell us about those final days. I felt um, it's funny. I don't remember. I don't remember saying that, um, but I do. I do certainly remember being nervous. I still thought that we were going to win, but I thought part of the reason why I thought I was we were going to win is because I, there seemed some sort of karmic insurance that the harder it got, um, the uglier the things that Trump said were that we would we were we would surely win because I believe that's how things worked in America, and then we lost. Right. And and I described in the book, I mean, I wanted people to feel this, and I think a lot of women do. It felt like I was in a different universe when I woke up on November 9th. I felt like my phone wouldn't operate because I felt that disoriented. And I and tried to make sense of a place where the where a man who I you know who who I disagree with so much who 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 in my opinion you know treats women so badly could win and you know then the question is what do women do with that and what's been remarkable is we've managed to feel empowered by it because I, I think what it told us was we have been living by the wrong set of rules. You can either decide that Donald Trump was meant to win or you could decide that what happened was wrong and it shows that we're still living and not that this is anyone's fault because we just are all living in the universe that we inherited but we are still very much living in a world that was built for men. and that we have to imagine a new way. So that means, you know, it's, it's an example that I talk about with Hillary. We, I had this realization at one point in October that what we had done to her was made her a female facsimile of the qualities that we look for in a male president. 
And it was just a gut punch because you thought, wow, well, no wonder people think she's inauthentic. <laughs> and that's something that we have to go back to square one to fix. And I didn't even, couldn't even imagine what it would look like to fix that. And that's, that's when you see we sort of run out of road. I think that women of Hillary's generation, the baby boomers, they had to prove that they could do the job just as well as any man could do it and just the same as he could do it. And that's what we set out to do. Right. And now, but now you realize, I, yeah, I can do that. And I've always felt that way. I can do a job just as well as a man could, but I don't want to. I want to do the job the male woman would. So that means, you know, like I have a chapter in the book, nod less and cry more. Don't just absorb all the blows that you think you have to absorb because women have to prove they're strong. And if you feel like, you know, if you get a little emotional at work or something moves you to tears because you really care about it, that's okay too. Women get to make a new way in just not just like in the workplace, in politics. Right. And that's that's what that that's what the advice is about and it's not even about politics I wrote this with little girls and young women that are just starting out in mind but, but yeah Mike Barnacle look at the, the last thing I think anybody wants to hear us talk about is the campaign uh, Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump the last thing that I want to talk about really is that campaign but you the first chapter of your book is really compelling as the stories out of losers' locker rooms are always more interesting, more compelling than the winning locker rooms. That's yeah. my theory. Yeah. But you just uh, framed it up as if you know you, you were hurt by when you realized trying to reposition Hillary Clinton was just trying to make her sound more like a male candidate. Is what you just said. Mm -hmm. How do you reposition, or alter, or improve? Yeah. A woman who has been on the national stage for 30 years and is so fixed, not just in her positions, but in her attitude and her view of the country. I mean, and she's filled with enormous amounts of, uh, you know, earned paranoia, I would say. How do you do, right. how do, you do that? Uh, well, evidently, we didn't, right? And I, I think that the further, and it's painful for me to say this, but the further we get away from that, from her campaign, I think what what she went through is what the first woman was, was sort of destined to experience. And for me, anyway, you know, my experience coming out of it is it proved we have to think about this differently. And I don't mean to say we try to turn her into a man. We, we <coughs> wanted to prove that she had the qualities that people look for in an American president. You're strong. You're capable. You don't, you know, you don't show emotion. You're very stoic. And you had, and because she's a woman, you had to, uh, we had to overcompensate, I think, for that. And I think, and it's hard, you know, so now, now we're in the territory of how do you change human behavior that's, that, you know, we're living with the manifestation of, you know, thousands of years. Of, of interactions with men and women. And I think the most important thing you can do is change what's in your own mind. Well, as what do you tell the next woman? I think it's, it's be aware of this. You know, don't, I think, I did not think it was a big deal to elect a woman president, okay? I thought we elected the first African American president and that was harder and a bigger deal. And I didn't think it was going to be that hard or that different. And what I think women that are running for politics, you know, young women that are entering the workforce, what they should understand is it is still a revolutionary idea for women to even be in the workplace, for women to be in politics when you step back. Women have only had the right to vote for less than 100 years. And we've only been in the workplace for 100 years. And we spent centuries yeah. and centuries making the workplace a comfortable place for men. Nobody's fault. It's just the world we inherit. So you have to think about it differently. And I think the most important thing is to change what's in your own mind. And if you think that doesn't feel right for me, it's not. It wasn't built right. with you in mind. So, so Susan, one of, the, one of the things that I noticed, uh, and actually we talked about on set in 2008, was what 2008 taught us. And we actually said this in real time, even before Barack Obama beat Hillary Clinton in the primary was that it was remarkable that we were discovering that in America it was harder for a woman to get elected president than it was for a black candidate in a majority white country to get elected president. Why is it that the United States of America stands alone in the West as the only country where this barrier still exists, where we cannot elect women as presidents. And what's also shocking is women outnumber men as voters. So 
we're not, women are not actually supporting other women just based on that. And it kind of brings me to my point, Jen, is you know, as operatives, we always teach men how to run against women and right. women how to run against men. But we don't necessarily teach women how to run as themselves. Right. And I think that's the next mm -hmm. thing that we have to move forward on. So to all those women who are running in office this right. year, how do you break down the need to seem strong and do all of the things that are qualities that we look mm -hmm. for in elected officials? Right but still run as yourself. I think that you have to be, it's, I mean, it's very hard. Like I said, we are, like, we're pushing against human history now, where this is, like, this is very uh, learned behavior. But I look, I look at two things. One is Yolanda King, Martin Luther King's granddaughter, right, who spoke at the march on Saturday, and Emma Gonzalez, who stood on the stage and cried for six and a half minutes in the amount of time of the, uh, that it took for the shooting to happen in Parkland. And I was like, that's what it looks like for women to lead, those two young women. And what happens is you have all the confidence in the world as a little girl, right? There's nothing more confident in the world than a little girl. And we lose it because we learn, and we learn to lose it. We learn to become inhibited. And that is like, that's what the book is about, is, un, is unlearn those. And for women candidates, I think keep a positive attitude about it, but be aware that this, this of this unconscious, um, the, these, these unconscious biases that exist. You know, we had an, an acronym on the campaign, T-S-A-H-I-J-D-L. There's something about her I just don't like. And that's something that uh, there were interviews about Hillary from the 92 campaign before anything, right? Uh, before she'd been in office, before it hasn't been in office. Um, what do you think Bill Clinton's wife? You know, there's just something about her I just don't like. And it wasn't malicious, and it wasn't, um, and, it, and, 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 and they weren't men as sexist comments. It's just we sort of struggle and are vexed by women that step out of roles um, mm -hmm. that they're traditionally in. So my advice to women candidates is you just have to be aware of that, but don't limit yourself to thinking you have to behave in the same path that we've always put candidates on. Yeah. Jennifer, do you think, I mean, is, you talk to Hillary Clinton, I, I assume, a fair amount still. Mm -hmm. Is she in a place now where she can take some solace for what seems to be going on among women candidates certainly being recruited across the field? I mean, it's a little early to know I mean, wh where this is all going to lead. But do you have a sense that she's in a solace place, or is uh, the other remarks that we saw in India the other day more emblematic of where she is right now? I think that she, I think she is uh, really inspired by what she sees with all of the women candidates that are running, with um, things like the uh, the March for Life, yes, on this weekend, and just how much people care and are turning out and are empowered to uh, to do this. Well, I just found out you're from Pascagoula, so you're a homegirl. Pascagoula, this is, this is Mississippi, so is so great. There's a cultural shift. Me Too movement represents a cultural shift. Yeah. Something is changing. Patriarchy is being challenged. Yeah. What does it mean for women to exercise power? Now, there's a critique of identity politics. There's no necessary relationship between being black and being fundamentally anti-racist. There's no necessary relationship between being a woman and necessarily trying to undermine patriarchy. Right. What do you say to women who want to exercise power? And how will that change fundamentally? the world for the least of these. I really think the most powerful thing you can do is change what's in your own and in your own mind. And that is that's what the first chapter of the book was about. That's what I decided to change in my own mind that as devastating as that election result was, I was not going to accept that women were meant to lose and that I had I had some good lessons to draw on from when I worked in the Obama White House. You know, that was a scary thing. You're White House communications director. You're advising the President of the United States. Um, and when you say, when you speak, your words matter. And it, that, even having the job, I was still intimidated by it. And, you know, President Obama said once to a group of women when, that we were meeting with them, it was just women, that happened more than once. And he could see somebody was holding back and he said, speak up, you're in the room. He's like sort of gestured around like, see, see the rounded walls, it's the Oval Office, this is it, this is no other room. Mm. And All I right. thought, you know, you gotta like, you're, you got, you're giving these opportunities, you gotta speak up and believe that you can make your own, in your own mind, you can make that difference. All right, Jen Palmieri. I didn't know you were a Pascagoula native. Yes, yes. This is why I. This is why I'm also such a fan of Pensacola. 
That's why you love Pensacola so much. We'll head back over to Pensacola. Everybody right. misses you. Thanks for being with us. The book is Dear Madam President, Jen Palmieri. As always, it's great talking to you. Thank you. Morning, Joe. We'll be back in three minutes. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.